Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Perminda. Hi, Rue as well, I think, is uh, joining. Um, just want to welcome our audience to this Friday lunchtime talk um, and just a few words on housekeeping as we begin. The format of the talk will be 45 minutes of talking and then about 10 minutes of audience questions. So please, um, audience members, if you could use the Zoom Q&A function to ask questions, I'll monitor that throughout and then come back in at the end and ask the questions. Um, the talk is being recorded, but it's a webinar, so none of the audience will be seen on screen at any time. So to introduce our speakers today, uh, we have Faminda Kaur here, whose work can currently be seen in Icon's first floor galleries. Some of our audience may remember that Cold Comfort was exhibited at Icon in 1996. Faminda's practice as a sculptor is characterised by a bold and highly creative approach to the materials, through which she explores the territory of cultur cultural identity, home and belonging. She uses simple forms like furniture and toys, objects that resemble displaced domestic belongings, which have been distorted and manipulated to invoke the uncanny. Rue Dissou's art practice explores the relationships and connections we have with one another, as well as how we formulate a sense of self. She investigates how multiplicity in culture is conducive to the concept of belonging and space. She is interested in facilitating discourse around race, gender, and social class and the performability of these social structures. And uh, Rue is currently working as ICON's research assistant uh, for the ongoing exhibition ICON in the 1990s. So Rue, uh, that's introductions done. Shall I hand over to you and then I'll come back in in about 45 minutes to chair the audience questions. Thanks, that's great, Thanks. Jane. Hi, Faminda. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to go straight in and just talk about the fact that I've throughout this role I've had such a privilege uh, browsing through archives here at ICON um, and I felt myself being really transported back in time to the 1990s. I can sort of draw so many parallels between my own experiences as an artist practicing today. Um, so I just want to know what was the journey like for you? What was it like practicing in the 1990s? Um, that's, a, that's a really really big question. I'm going to start by talking about three very early works that I made in the early 90s. Um, a bit background about myself, I did a degree at Sheffield Polytechnic from 1986 to 89 before going to Glasgow School of Art to do an MA 1990 to 92. Um, this work is called Self-Portrait, <laughs> as you can see, the portrait of me, and it was made um, for a large group exhibition created by Eddie Chambers in 1990. Um, it was a self-portrait show, show called Let the Canvas Come to Life with Dark Faces. Um, majority of the work in that show was painting and there were four or five of us who were sculptors. And I decided to make this large, over two meter high self-portrait of myself, you know. <laughs> well, um, as you do. <laughs> as you do, and, um, but um, it's sort of undermined by the fact that it's quite invisible, you can look through it, so it's not completely solid. And then I filled the head with um, wooden objects, which were toy-like, um, of Indian objects mainly, and it sort of fills the head to a certain level, um, so they're like the memories, sort of like the childhood memories you have, they are integral to you and that influences who you are as you grow up. Um, so very early on in my work, I was working with um, themes about my identity, about culture. Um, okay, can we have the next slide? I mean, I was quite lucky early on in that I was showing quite extensively as a student. So this work I made on my first year as an MA in Glasgow. I was, invite, I was invited again by Eddie Chambers to take part in an exhibition called Four by Four. And I made these six large glass structures of houses in the design of houses found in the Punjab region, Punjab region in the north of India. And then filled it with ceramic objects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, all these objects were Sikh or Indian, and I made them in terracotta, so you couldn't tell whether they were everyday items or historical objects. And because they're placed in these large glass 
houses, it felt like a museum display. Um, next slide. Okay. So, sorry, what are you going to say? <laughs> No, I just I thought I really like the uh, the material quality of those objects. They're really beautiful. I know. I started off quite early on setting a set of guidelines and ways of working, and one of them was trying to limit working with only two materials. So, like here is ceramics with glass, and the previous work was wood and metal, and not using found objects. Always making objects from scratch. Amazing. Next slide. And then in the second year of my MA, I was commissioned by the BBC to do work for a billboard. It was, it had about 18 artists, some big names in there, quite a lot of big names actually. Um, Damien Hurst, Helen Chadwick. It was, and the majority, actually all of them except for me, had done an image based work. I decided to make a sculptural work and so to attach something to a billboard. Um, and it was it was on the street in Glasgow, Cathedral Street, right in the centre, just around the corner from the main train station. I mean, it was difficult trying to find two billboards that faced each other, but we did. Um, and so it was like a, a private conversation in a very, very public space. So it was like con contradictory to what billboards usually they are, giving direct messages. Mine was my, more like, you're not sure what was going on. There were clues who the speakers represented. So. On one of the billboards, you have a lotus flower, a wheel, and then my initials PK and Punjabi, very opposite of one large billboard where there was an eight sided star pattern, which is a pattern that can be found in a lot of buildings in the north and regions of India. So I wanted to talk about these three works to give some sort of context of where my work led to. That I don't always make, sometimes I do do work about my own identity. Yeah, it's really interesting. You mentioned Eddie Chambers quite a lot. I imagine in the 1990s, like he was a really key figure in kind of like supporting your practice. I am, um, yeah, he was. I mean, I look back now and yeah, because he, I mean, there was always this double edged sword about taking part in these shows, but on another level, he gave my work so much visibility and I could work on um, large projects and work in a way that normally I wouldn't have, you know, the funds or the means to do so. So, yeah, he was, he was a key component and a key, you know, he was a keen supporter of my work from quite very early on. Yeah, and you also said that sometimes you make work about cultural identity. I'm interested in what kinds of audience your work drawed. Um, like, what were the audience like in the 1990s in general, art audiences or even non-art audiences? The audiences then were, um, it was a lot, lot smaller. I mean, in general, it was more... There was only a certain type of person who would go to museums or galleries. It wasn't being an artist wasn't, you know, widely accepted or so. I mean, now it's a lot wider, a lot bigger audience. And even back then, I'd say that when I use certain symbols in my work, um, they might not be instantly understood because it wasn't a large, you know, Asian audience that went to galleries, which there is now. So the audience changed but it's changed for lots of different reasons yeah did you think that that hold, held you back in any way those kind of signs and signifiers not being understood by uh kind of the a white majority perhaps or white western majority not really i mean it's quite appropriate we've got this work on <laughs> show at the <laughs> moment because i feel that this work works on lots of different levels so I first made this work, I, after Glasgow, I moved to Barcelona. And there I wasn't seen as a um, British Indian artist. I was seen really. But they didn't have that sort of way of looking at an artist, which was very important to me. And so I made this work in Barcelona and it is very much about my cultural identity, but I also feel it works on lots of different levels. Um, in terms of me, access points, maybe? Um, in, in terms of interpretations, so yeah. that I think when I first showed this work in Barcelona, um, it was seen as maybe a ceremonial, a ceremonial dress from the Middle East. And I, 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 was I was okay with that. I didn't expect them to read it as a Sikh garment. And I'm still happy. I mean, because I don't expect everyone to know 
you know, about Sikhism or what the symbols are and why I use certain colours, because the, the colour orange is very symbolic for Sikhs, as you know, and yeah. it's wearing a knife, a kapan, which is one of the five Ks that Sikhs wears. But for me, the most important reading of this work was that, was the juxtaposition of putting the knife next to a child's garment and then placing it in a, in a, a black frame. Because it's that juxtaposition which sort of makes you think about um, about is a child born into a certain religion? You know, it's that choice yeah. or no choice. It's sort of that was the most important reading to me. Yeah, I and, can really see that now. And the secondary reading that it uh, um, has all these symbols to it wasn't so important. So um, just kind of thinking about some of the questions that I had earlier as well. Um, I came across an interview that you had with Eddie Chambers where you spoke about how, and you've just reiterated that, how Barcelona reframed why you made certain work or perhaps how uh, your priorities have changed as well. Is there any more kind of experience, uh, pieces of work that you can draw on that brings that in as well? Well, this next image is, an, I mean, when I was in Barcelona, I think a lot of my work and the themes I worked on became more inward looking. I started making furniture, distorted furniture, beds, chairs, and different domestic environments. Um, and I started using fabrics, so color came into my work. Um, but I also became aware how I was a product of, you know, 1980s, 1990s, art, British art education, how I had a very British approach to making works. When I had my studio next to other Spanish and Catalan artists, my work and my approach to making work was very, very different from them. And that fascinated me. Um, and the priorities and the emphasis that were important to them were different to mine. So it made me question, you know, and realize, you know, everything I was taught and to look at it in a different way. So going back, See, this work, this work is it's called Cot. <laughs> Often my titles are quite simple descriptions of the work. Um, and it's a distorted cot. It's grotesque in ways because I've elongated it, made it taller. And there are eight mattresses and it sort of reference. And this is something I do quite like how my work references um, um, nursery rhymes or fairy tales. So this one references maybe the princess and the pea. So whichever child would sleep in this cot, would they feel the layers of the garments that are being placed in between the mattresses below? Really interesting. Um, I love the way that you kind of uh, really distort materials as well to kind of um, play with scale. I find scale is a really big thing in your work. Um, and I can see that here at um, Icon, but throughout your uh, time and throughout all of the work that you've made. Um, at the time in the 90s, you actually had two solo shows simultaneously in different venues, one at Mead Gallery and in Coventry and here at Icon. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what those shows were like? Um, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, in the Icon show, um... I showed four works. So when you entered the icon, this is the first work you would see, the one on the left, which was a curtain put behind a glass frame. Um, next slide, please. Um, so for me, looking back at the icon show, I realized that the whole show is falling. And here, the birds have fallen off the curtain. There's a little snap fastness on the curtain and a little snap fastness on the pattern and the pattern's fallen to the ground. But because there's a glass frame in the way, um, the birds can't be reattached. So there's, you know, you start, start the show by seeing the patterns on the floor. And then if you go to the next slide, you have, I made these three very tall beds. Uh, about three and a half meters high. And it's all about insecurity and, you know, safe place to sleep. On one level, I mean, I 
climb these beds <laughs> and slept in them. No, I haven't slept in them. I've laid in them. <laughs> you know, I, wouldn't, sure? <laughs> I wouldn't sleep in them. Um, but it's sort of quite nice because it does feel a bit like a sanctuary. You're high up, you're separated, you're isolated from everything going around. So there is a nice feeling of having your own space. But of course, it's the thing that would you feel safe to fall? I mean, most people don't fall out of bed when they're sleeping, but you know, would you risk it? Um, Are you afraid of heights, Pamenda? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> but I'll tell you a little thing though. <laughs> sure. um, that I was going through a stage at that time as an adult falling out of my bed. Oh, wow. So it made me think about, about keeping yourself safe. And you know, what if that ability, you lose that ability? Because you think when you're sleeping, you know, you, you're safe. You, but if you <laughs> then, you know, in your sleep, you, you can't control what you're doing. So it did make me think about what if I made the beds really tall um, to represent that feeling of not feeling safe. Mm. And because it's three of them, it's sort of like they're the norm. This is like a, a community of beds, a community of people who sleep high up. Um, next slide. And the fourth work in this show was these four white horses. Um, they're, they're cutouts of like large horses and they're, they're armed. If I don't see them, they're meant to be like armed horses, but just like a flat cut out drawing of them made out of this white satin fabric. And then I had them hanging at the wall, on the wall. So it's like the horses have left. There's just like the empty garments or they're like empty sleep garments. I don't know, just hanging on the wall. So you've got the things falling and then you've got things empty. Think the person not there or the horse not there. Um, um, next slide. And then on the back wall, which you might have seen in the earlier slide, I had um, these figures called falling because to me, they look like they're falling down the wall. Uh, they're figures that are curled up into impossible positions, um, wrapped up in their own worlds, and they sort of form the wallpaper in the space. So the whole space became like this sort of uncanny, strange bedroom yeah. where you didn't quite know, and because I don't, use real objects you're not sure of the history you're not sure what's happening it has more of a dreamlike quality to it that it sort of deals directly in ways with emotions because it circumvents lots of other readings of it so you go straight into looking at states of being really yeah I'm really intrigued and I think that the the title of the show itself cold comfort is really important because when, when I see the materials up close, there are these kind of like really hard surfaces. And then there are these soft, fleecy, comfortable figures. And then, you know, uh, you've got the push and pull of materials. So it's satin, armed horses, draped really kind of lusciously. And then you've got these hard, edgy, uh, strong structural frames. Um, so it's really about materiality when I'm looking at your work materiality and how you're conveying this kind of sense of push and pull with the materials. Um, there's a common misconception, I think, from audiences um, that your work is about culture and identity only. I, be um, I believe this is the case for like so many of us artists from the global majority or from the diaspora, um, for myself as well. Um, how do you overcome this misconception, if at all? I don't think I mean I, this is the icon show as it is now. Um, sorry, again, we lost you slide? for a minute there, Paminda. Okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Can we go to the next slide? Sorry. Um, in answer to that question, it made me think of an exhibition that I took part of in '98. Um. The exhibition was called Krishna, the Divine Lover. And this was in the Whitechapel Gallery in London. And they commissioned, I think, six or seven contemporary artists to make work. The rest of the show was these beautiful, you know, as you can imagine, miniature paintings 
of Krishna. Yeah. And I mean, it's always problematic when there is contemporary art placed next to historical works. It's often the contemporary art doesn't, you know, um, doesn't, can't compete with it. It's not uh, as widely accepted. Yeah. And so when I was invited to take part in the show, I thought Krishna, he's the God of love. So I was going to do a work about relationships. So I made these pairs of figures. They're 52 pairs of figures. And they are, you know, they're all in different types of relationships. Like if you can see the center ones, they look like they're dancing. So there's some are positive, you know, some of the figures are nice to each other and some of the figures are not so nice. It's just all the different combinations I could think of how two people could be together. And they're not sewn together, they're held by snap fasteners so that I feel like they could change position if they needed to. Um, the, and when I had the work in the show, I, my work was quite heavily criticised. Oh, wow. I, I mean, some of the articles, it was, and the main criticism that was that the work, uh, or that work I had made wasn't Indian enough. But then <laughs> yeah, I knew, that one before. <laughs> but then the creators knew that when they, you know, asked me to, you know, take part in the show. So, but also it was criticized because the, you know, they're saying it's just cut figures. How can they have any, represent anything? There was, and it's, and I think that whole thing is, you know, it's really complex about how Indian or how much of those symbols we should put in our work. And I think it's really quantifiable in terms of our own identity. But uh, in terms of the work, how are you supposed to show whether you're Indian enough? Do you use the visual language and symbols, or is it just because you're Indian that that work is therefore, you know, of that language? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking if this work was shown in a different show, I don't think I would have received the same sort of criticisms either. Exactly. It would have because it was a context of the show, so it it's really difficult because ideally you should be able to make able to make work about whatever you want not just about an entity that's always been my argument that there should be the freedom to make you know be able to make because there are other things that happen in my life there's other things i want to make work about you know which are also important to me exactly rather than being pigeonholed into a, a specific box about making work about being indian or being british or making work about cultural identity you know, the idea of sleeping is something that is part of all, all humanity and something that we all partake in. Um, precisely, yes, that's true, so much, yes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, on the theme of sleeping, um, I think that there's a clear theme of beds that seem to run throughout your work. And, a, and as I said before, the push and pull of materiality. Um, I'm, I'm just interested in whether this kind of material play and this juxtaposition, what it really means to be comfortable is a conscious decision. How do you select all your materials when you're um, conceptualizing your work? Uh, um, could I have an, oh yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, I think more recently I've settled down into fabrics and metals because I, I like the softness of fabrics jarring against the harshness of steel or copper. And I just keep, when I'm working away in the studio, finding new ways of connecting them. And so it's like, I think more when I was younger, I did change a lot more materials I was using, but I'm always open because when I go to a store, I see materials in my hand, I just, just lost you for a minute there sorry about that. Idea. have you lost me again yeah, yeah. just no, that when was you me. That's my the material I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said I, about look, going to the material store oh the materials oh i use are so important you know because it's just i look i feel the material and there's just somebody i get lots of different ideas i could do this with it i could want this i could join it with this so Often the ideas are led by materials or sometimes it's led by concept. It varies. There's both ways of working and I like working with both. And it's both ways are quite intuitive. Yeah. Um, like say, for example, this bed, 
the copper bed or the bed with flames. I made a bed in copper because I just thought I'd be interested to see what it looked like. And then it looked so beautiful, you know, this shiny copper and it was shiny and perfect and it was too nice and too perfect. So then I drilled lots of holes in it. And then it went too sad, <laughs> it went the other extreme. So then I tried to fix it by stuffing red fabric in it. And to me, the fabric looked like um, flames. So that's why I titled the work this way. But it also led to lots of other different readings, but that was just playing with the materials. You know, it wasn't planned when I first made the work. I knew I wanted to make a copper bed, but it was just trying out different things and seeing, you know, where the ideas led. And what I, I really love the simplicity of your work. I just feel like sometimes you're kind of bounded with being overly conceptual, overly philosophical, and you know, really have to explain the hell out of some works. But I, I just love the simplicity of like the, the way that you title the works, the way that you put play with materials and just experiment and do whatever you want. It just shows that you can really work outside of you know, these stereotypes and misconceptions that often are portrayed on global majority citizens. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not, I don't go out to do that, but that's just, you know, I'm just, I just fascinated by material. So that does take over sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. but the, the, always, the concept's always important. There always has to be like, when I'm deciding it is, I am working out how the work might be read or how, where the, the viewers ideas might go and not to close down the meanings too too much but to keep it open um, yeah. can we go to the next slide and i thought i'd show these next four images just to show that i sometimes work photographically um but i do find it difficult because suddenly i've got a real bed and a real room and i i struggle with that sometimes but in this work, it's all about states of mind. It's about the needing to sleep, I suppose. Like there's a bed in the kitchen in the left and then the bed in the bathroom. And the bed looks slept in, but the rooms are quite nice. You know, they're not, it's not a rough area to be. It's, um, um, next slide. It's more about, yeah, like a state of mind um, about, I suppose going through life sleeping it was sort of represented just an it was another way of using the bed and looking at how because the bed is you know so symbolic of so many different things about security sleep safety and I think that's why I keep going back to or went through a period of time of using the bed um so extensively um next slide Last one of the beds. I mean, I've made a lot more beds than this. <laughs> this is, this so is just, many beds. This is, this, this is just a short selection. And then I had these four figures. I, I, I don't think I can call them figures. There were four blobs um, sleeping in the corner of my studio. Um, there were three yellow ones and one dark blue. Um, and then there's, I, I thought it was quite a throwaway playful work you know I mean it does look harsh in my studio I admit that you know, the concrete floor looks <laughs> quite a harsh place to sleep but even when I showed this work in different gallery space in pristine white cubes the figures would look really sad and forlorn but I was thinking but they're just blobs they have no arms legs no features but people would feel sorry for them and I'm saying but it but not even these, you know, they're, they're very basic. So for me, I thought it was a light, you know, playful work, but it actually came out a lot darker than I meant. Um, and so, yeah. And um, just thinking about kind of all of these different beds, um, I came across some work that you were showing at HS Projects while you were installing here at ICON. And again, we have, some small beds creeping in. Um, can you tell us a bit about that show? Um, 
The, oh yes, um, I mean, the, the HS projects invited me to show work. They have a, a spot. They show sculptural work in this foyer in a high end of London, in the Victoria area of London. And I like working site specifically and responding to site. So when they asked me, I was like really intrigued. Um, the, my first thought when I went into the foyer was, I want to convert this into a, a domestic setting. I mean, looking for all the images I'll show you, it shows it looks like that's all I do, but it's not actually. There's lots of other <laughs> things I do work about, but this talk seems to focus mainly on yeah. um, on works I would do with domestic settings. So for me, the first idea was I want to convert this into like a private home. And the thing that does that instantly is if you put a bed in a place, suddenly that's a private room. And so I made a bed again, and this is the first bed I've made in about 20 years. Um, and this is a single bed. It's slightly narrower than a real single bed. So it's, and there's no mattress. So it makes it feel like maybe the bed's abandoned. There's no one sleeping there. And then you have these colorful creatures underneath which seem to have taken over the bed. And the color, these color creatures, they're, because they're so colorful, they sort of like look to like toys, they're inviting, but then on their back, they have very sharp copper claws. So again, it's this push and pull. You're not sure if these creatures are friendly or not. Um, and it was strange to show it during the pandemic because then it suddenly took on another layer, level of meaning about what these creatures are. Oh, you know, these, I call them bugs, but they're not really bugs that have so many negative connotations. I don't think they're that negative. Um, and then it has other connotations like what you put under the bed. You know, it's the obvious one is like monsters for small children. Monsters Monster. sing. Yeah, I was monsters thinking in the about bed. That. <laughs> but I purposely didn't make a child's bed. I wanted to make an adult's bed. Mm -hmm. So it was, for me, it was about the things you put under the bed, things you want to hide, things you want to forget about. And so in some ways, it, does this owner of the bed, does it live with its monsters? Is it happy with the monsters? You know, it has so many different levels of meanings or interpretations. But the crux of it is, it's first of all deciding if these bugs are friendly or not. Do we want them there or not? And then it leads on to would you sleep here or not? And the next work I got one good to talk about here in the show was this work called Small Table. Um, uh, again, here I'm playing with si size in scale. So you have a really small table with a small chair, so it's like a child size. And then on top of it, you've got an even smaller table with four smaller chairs. So to me, this works about choice. Do you want to be sitting in the larger small chair or would you rather be on the tabletop with three other chairs? And I've made the top of the table quite welcoming. So I've given it a really colorful sort of half tablecloth carpet. And it's also about the relationship between the larger chair and the smaller chair. It's like, I think it's quite a nice balance. You know, there's not like one dominating the other. There's like, mm -hmm. The four smaller chairs have each other and they've got the colourful tablecloth, while the large one, it has its scale and it's on its own. So that it talks about, yeah, it's about hierarchy, basically, the work. And a lot I of really my work... like to lean on it with my elbows and just feel the softness under my <laughs> elbows. <laughs> Thank you. And the last image I'm going to show today is um, Overgrown House, which was also in the show. And this work is about... Being and in some ways it reflects on the bed, like the bed feels abandoned. And I think this house also has that abandoned feel to it because all that's left is um, a basic metal structure. But on the other side, it does feel like that it's growing as well because you've got all these offshoots around it and maybe another house could grow from those. And the main house, it looks like it could still be growing. So it's a structure that is both organic and inorganic. And that's something that, you know, that 
really interests me that just by simply placing, you know, circular steel tube onto square tube, it changes the meaning interpretation of that material and of the overall work. Mm. And it's like you saying, Ruth, it's just like simple changes can change the whole meaning of work, like with the tall bed, simply yeah. by elongating the legs, nothing else, the whole meaning, interpretation, and what the work is about changes. Yeah. That's, that's that's really, um, yeah, it's, it's so simple, but it creates a whole new set of meanings, just like you say. Um, you've exhibited so extensively since the 90s. I'm just thinking back to the first couple of slides that we were looking at, with the billboards and uh, with your self-portrait upon your MA. And up until today, to this very day, you've exhibited all over internationally. I'm just, I'm just curious, um, and I'm sure our audience are as well. What, what was it like exhibiting in the 90s compared to now? And has anything changed in your opinion? Well, the main thing is there's a larger audience. There's a lot like, uh, there's a lot, lot bigger audience that goes to galleries. Also, social media has changed everything because in the past I would put a show up and then, you know, hopefully there would be articles written about it and it would be talked about. But then I'd feel quite removed from the show while now there's like the continuous ongoing engagement with social media and also there's a wider social engagement goes on when the show goes on. So that's one aspect that's different. Um, yeah. I, I think um, for me personally, obviously I haven't, I was born in the nineties, so it's obviously really <laughs> kind of pertinent to me, but exhibiting now, I think that there's such a massive pressure on emerging artists coming out because there are all these different ways of engaging. And I feel like there is such a mass of artists that, you know, uh, sometimes people get lost within that. And um, yeah, equally, you're, you're not an artist that's from London. What do you think of the kind of whole aspect of exhibiting in London compared to exhibiting where, you know, or being an artist from your local home? Um, in the past, that was a, an even bigger issue. You had to you know, because I didn't go to art school in London and you did, you had to live in London really to, to make the networks, the friendship groups. Um, I think it's, in some ways, it's still important, but not as important. You can be based elsewhere. And I think there are like support networks in different cities that are quite helpful. I mean, in the past, when I, you know, in the 90s, it was like you, you try to get known locally, then you try to get known nationally, and then it was international. And, you know, there was, and there wasn't that many artists, um, especially Black and Asian. There wasn't that many, so you could have a better handle on knowing what was going on. Um, then today, it is quite overwhelming. And having yeah. as an artist, I think it's a lot harder because you have to do, deal with social media, deal with so many other things, and it's harder all around. You know. For everybody, because <laughs> now is real. <laughs> yes, um, and then uh, we're coming to the end of our talk now. Um, but just final one, final question that I wanted to end on: What does the '90s show at Icon mean to you, and what are your hopes for the show? I'm. I mean, I'm really happy that this work, falling and loss, are being shown there, because. I, I assume that not many people know of my, you know, my earlier work and that all that work can be forgotten. So, and I think that work is still quite relevant today. You know, it can still be read. It's not... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not outdated. Object. <laughs> um, so I think it's important to have shows like this because today everything sort of focuses on what's going on now, what's happening now you know and they want to know what shows you're working on now everything is about now and yeah. then it's good to know about what's happened before you know exactly and then um uh yeah so um that that concludes everything um Perminda, thank you so much um 
I think we'll save some questions for uh, the audience as well. Um, so James, if you want to come in. Hi, thanks for that both. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And um, we have got lots of questions, which is really good. Um, some of them are coming in as, I, as I'm speaking now, so I'll try to read through them. Um, but the first one, which came in you know, quite a few minutes ago, um, is from Jaskarat, who's asking, how do you feel supported as a Sikh female brown artist in today's age? Oh, that's quite hard. Um, I think it's... Um... I think there is more support now because there are more networks of um, other artists you can connect to, who you can get supported by. I mean, you can build up support networks, which I think when I was working in the 90s, there was, there wasn't really, there was support networks in that we all knew what each other were doing. Um, and then in the 80s, there was a lot of shows um, showing, um, you know, black artists. I mean, I showed work under that umbrella. When I say black artists, I'm talking about the umbrella of how I was known in the 1990s. Um, and so it was problematic to have black art shows there because it was a show based purely on a person's identity. But on the other side, it did get your work seen. So I think now I don't know if they would have these sort of shows again because they are, they are problematic. problematic. So in the answer to the question, I think it's all about trying to build networks more than anything, a supportive network, a framework and people you can talk to, to you know, support your work, to help you develop your critical ideas and maybe also trying to do that cross-generationally as well, because there are now, it's not just, you know, <laughs> there are different, different generations now. I'm not talking about like, you know, age generations. I'm just talking that coming out of college, I think they can be like, every 10 years or so, there's a shift in slightly in the way work is made. That's, I'm talking about artistic generations, not um, family generations. Yeah. There's um, a similar question here as well from Saima who asked, um, what role does class play in the arts and what can institutions and funders do to recognize the privilege so that they're opening up spaces for working classes who are invisible to them? Another loaded question. <laughs> I, think, I think you can answer that one, Rupi. <laughs> <Good move>. um, <laughs> uh, I guess it's about thinking about how to kind of dis like um un not unassemble dissemble these kinds of massive like social groups because um, as Perminda rightly mentioned in the nineties and the eighties, black was an all encompassing term for everything that wasn't white and western. Um, so we have so many intersections within that. And I think that, um, you know, th these days uh, there, there is the working class intersection and it's just about thinking about um, how to alleviate uh, or how to kind of uh, take away this kind of hierarchy or institutional system. And, you know, we were talking about London in the conversation. Sometimes London can have its own elitism with institutions and schools. Um, so it's thinking about kind of regional identities and all those different things. And I think uh, we, we, are, we are thinking about that within institutions. And um, I don't know, Paminda, have you seen much change going on? I think with, I mean, it's really hard to define with class mm. how that affects um, showing. Um, because we saw in the 90s, the YBAs who were clearly from a whole uh, working class group completely, you know, were put on this high massive pedestal. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really, I think it's becoming increasingly hard to define uh, class systems, um, but there are institutions such as Jerwood and um, other, other places who are kind of like thinking about ways in which to um, pull that apart, pull that structure apart. And I think ACE have got a new strategy out as well, don't they? I mean, class it does affect, because it's all about financing, because yeah. obviously if you can finance making work, finance having a student, and now in this day when you have huge student loans, it can be really, really hard because 
to um, finance. And it's, it is, I think it is a lot, lot harder now. I do, I do, really do, because of the student finances and paying for studio spaces and finding external work. Because in my, I suppose, a lot of my peers would have worked in art colleges and taught to finance their practice, um, which is a lot harder to get now. And so, in that way, class is, yeah, it's about money, basically. It's, you can't finance making your work. It is really hard. And so there are all these schemes to try and help emerging artists, but then there's a real lack for the next stage, you know? So they're helping the ones just coming out or recently graduated, but they're finding that the ones who have been doing it for maybe 10 years, they can't apply to the scheme, but that there doesn't seem to be that much interest in supporting them and I think artists also nowadays have to take on so much more than they did in the past you know you have to deal with I keep saying social media but you have to deal with so much more and um and it's difficult to access um like mentoring support and all of that which is sorely needed I mean even I like to have mentoring support because sometimes there are just issues I which are difficult to deal with yeah, I think it's all about kind of building those kind of structures through uh, networking with people who are, you know, um, in kind of like the same circles and trying to um, talk to more and more people to build that network in order to kind of um, bridge those gaps and to support ourselves. You know, if you can't find that support in an institution, you have to look for it in, an, in, an, in a social network, not an Instagram network, but, you know, social <laughs> <laughs> I mean you may have answered this question already but there is actually a question here what advice would you give to an artist struggling to believe in themselves and Rue you might um, have an answer here actually seeing as you've managed to project your career forwards despite the challenges of the last year and you're starting a PhD soon as well yeah um, if I'm going to be honest mine has all been about networking and, it, and yes it is really exhausting um, to network but um, surrounding yourself around kind of people with, uh, so Perminda Kaur is also one of my mentors, um, but surrounding yourself around people who, who believe in you. I mean, if you don't believe in yourself, you need others to believe in you um, in order that you can believe in yourself. I, um, I did my BA in 2011 and finished in 2014 and had no belief in myself whatsoever. And so I went to go and work in a supermarket for five years so I had no arts practice at all until 2019, uh, unbelievably. Um, and I just, I found a network. I established SARC. Uh, SARC is the South Asian Artist Network. Um, and some of the members are here today. Um, and just found, found a crowd that I could uh, be around and that supported me. Um, and then went and applied for lots of different things. And sure, there were a lot of rejections because I didn't have an MA or I didn't have enough of a portfolio. But, you know, you've just got to kind of try and find um, a crowd like that because there are so many different artists run spaces and things like that, it, you know, in the in the cities. I don't know what it's like in other cities, but I know in Birmingham there are, you know, there are the big institutions such as Icon and places like that. And then there is the smaller artist run spaces. And at the end of the day, we're when we're starting out our career, we're all at the very start. And, you know, most artists you speak to never forget that. I know for sure when I'm speaking to Perminda, you know, we've got that kind of understanding that everyone starts from somewhere. Um, so yeah, just surrounding yourself with people, applying for loads of stuff and being okay with rejection. That was a great <laughs> answer. <laughs> um, so Mary has asked um, Perminda, uh, she's wondering which artists has it had in influenced you? Oh, so many artists. I mean, I think most of my influences came when I was an artist in the 20s. I mean, I still in now, but not much. So I love the work of, I mean, when I moved to Barcelona, one of the reasons I love Barcelona, because they had all this amazing public sculpture. Um, and so there was people like Lothar Baumgarten, um, Richard Terrell, and some Americans. I can't remember their names now. I mean, Louise Bourgeois, of course. Love her work. Um, I can see that huh? now, slightly, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
I can't remember the names of them now. God, that's really bad. Rebecca Horn. So mainly sculptural works. Um, the ones, um, the op, the Art Pavot movement. I love all of their works. Most of their artists. Uh, what's his name? Can't remember the names, but yeah, because Art Pavot basically because it's about the simplicity of the materials are used. Because Art Pavot means you know poor art, so they're just using very basic materials and making art out of them. So I was very influenced by that. Um, I wasn't really influenced by many. I mean, when I was studying, I was trying to find out other, you know, black or Asian artists, but they are actually closer in age to me than <laughs> they're only a few years older than me. So it's, it was hard, you know, I did look at their work. Uh, trying to think, Mona Hatoum, yeah, I love her work. So yeah, there's so many. <laughs> yeah, so many. And there's not so many recently though. Uh, um, there's a lot of work I like the look of, but I don't think I'm so much of a sponge like I was younger, where I was just taking looking, everything. looking, yeah, taking everything in, soaking everything up. Are there any more questions, James? Just realised that I was on mute then. Uh, <laughs> not the first time I've done that for the last uh, 15 months or so. Yeah, there's uh, so Raksha has, it's more of an observation really than a question. Um, but Raksha said, I'm not sure if this is a question, um, but just a thought in response to criticism received in the work shown in Krishna, Krishna the Divine Lover. Um, my thoughts are who has the right to discern what is or looks Indian and what does that mean anyway? Um, and then talks a little bit about um, Indian art over the centuries uh, and says, personally, that thought never occurred to me about those works. Um, as whether something looks Indian or not in a show connected to Indian miniatures is irrelevant. Um, so I guess just any other thoughts about that criticism? Um, I think that criticism wouldn't happen today um, at all. It's just something of that time or that era, um, mainly, yeah. I think people would be a lot more careful now. Yeah, I think there are pros and cons of exhibiting now and exhibiting back in the 90s. And I think there's something really important to be said for the fact that the term black was all encompassing because I feel like uh, now, you know, it's really hard to kind of establish um, and to stop kind of homogenizing the term South Asian or Indian because there are so many, again, intersections within that. And people look to what is Indian art and then try to bracket loads of things together that aren't necessarily, you know, responding to that or uh, pigeonholing certain pieces of art as well. Um, so just one last question and it's one from me to you, Rue, if this is okay. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to ask you what it's been like being a, a researcher at ICON for the last few months and you know how how you've enjoyed, I presume, um, researching for Minda's work and, and what you think of the exhibition generally and, and how you've enjoyed looking back towards the 90s? Um, first of all, I absolutely loved looking back at the 90s. Like, I feel all of the artists that were showing at Icon are all big names. So that's really important, firstly, um, because we're looking at how these artists kind of uh, were around each other, supporting each other. I mean, we've got the likes of Adrian Piper from the US, so, and, and you know, another big name and how they were doing things internationally. But equally, I'm really interested in how we work locally. So looking through the archives, I found so many different articles from Chambers, from Piper, uh, from Perminza's work, and just kind of drawing all those links and thinking about what that means now for me as an artist and thinking about the links and the collectives that I try to create within my peer groups. Um, so it's been, it's been really amazing. Like, I feel like I... Because I was born in the 90s, it was quite nice to go back there, <laughs> having not ever experienced that art. And um, there's something really nice about looking through, I was telling Kaminda, like looking through emails, I felt a bit nosy at the start, but like just reading like the way communication was done, how work was like transported from one place to another, all these kind of little things that you don't even know about. Um, or you don't ever see on the uh, the surface and then comparing that to now because um thinking about how 
the 90s show was uh, actually came together. So um, for the audience members who don't know, this show was supposed to be um, last year. Um, and I think that it would have been a whole different story if it was shown during like the significant social movement that were going on last year. Um, but yeah, this was originally a 2020 show, but postponed due to COVID. And just seeing it all come alive and come together has just been a really amazing experience. So I'm really thankful for it. Um, and really thankful to be able to have these kinds of uh, conversations with artists, um, uh, artists such as Faminda, who I've been a really big fan of. Um, so yeah, uh, really great experience. Good. I'm glad you said that. Didn't, didn't <laughs> um, <laughs> you kind of put me on the spot here. <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, yeah. So uh, on that note, this is the final of our. Uh, I think this is the last of our Friday afternoon conversations for now. But there's much more program coming in August. So um, everyone in the audience should keep an eye out because there's a lot more about to be published online. And come um, and see the show. Yeah, and come and see the show. So the show is open until the end of August. So there's plenty of time still to see it. And we have a really nice book as well, which features images of Faminda's work somewhere. I should have bookmarked this. There we go. <laughs> um, I don't know how much it costs. It's probably around 15 pounds, I think, Ruth. It's 10 pounds if you come it's to 10 the pounds. show. There you go. But 15 pounds um, if you don't. <laughs> so yeah, we'll leave it there then. But just to say thanks so much to both of you. I've really, really yeah. enjoyed the conversation today.